The Paris Peace Accords were signed after four years of delicate negotiations by the Nixon administration, with National Security Advisor Dr. Henry Kissinger serving as the chief U.S. negotiator in Paris. Dr. Kissinger writes in his recently published leadership that Hanoi, quote, had not fought for decades against both France and America for the sake of a political process or a negotiated compromise, but to achieve a total political victory. To explore every avenue of negotiations, Nixon now resumed secret political talks with Hanoi. Hanoi would send its chief negotiator and Politburo member, Lu Duc Tho, to Paris, where I would connect with him every three months or so, end quote. To explore this further, the four years of negotiations and military exercises amid the wider, ongoing implementation of a new grand strategy. It is my pleasure to introduce David Prentice of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Oklahoma State University, Thomas Schwartz, Distinguished Professor of History at Vanderbilt University, George J. Veith is a former Army Captain, Dr. Veith is author of four books on the Vietnam War. Moderating this conversation is Dr. Luke Nichter, the James H. Cavanaugh Endowed Chair in Presidential Studies at Chapman University, and I now turn it over to Dr. Nichter. Well, thanks for that introduction, Jim. Um, I should say at the outset, it's, it's no easy thing for a presidential foundation and library to welcome academic scrutiny, uh, especially on a difficult and controversial subject like this. So uh, for that reason, I'd like to say hats off uh, to the Richard Nixon Library and Foundation for providing this forum for really a free exchange of ideas on this important anniversary. Uh, you know, for those of us joining us from the earlier panel uh, on President Nixon's grand strategy for the war in Vietnam or Mark Moyer's excellent keynote, keynote remarks, uh, we've already heard a lot of new ideas and discussion uh, and probably have developed a full head of steam by, by this point in our program. Um, I'd like to follow in Mark Updegrove's footsteps in the first panel by suggesting that you tweet, if you have a question, at Nixon Foundation or email info at nixonfoundation.org. And the plan is that they'll pass me the questions about halfway through our panel, and I'll, I'll do my best to toggle back and forth and, and incorporate them in our discussion. Uh, otherwise, I will keep my remaining remarks brief here, just enough to let our audience know what to expect for the duration of our panel. You know, this is really less of a celebration than it is a somber commemoration of sorts as well as an opportunity to gauge what we've learned these past 50 years. There are also plenty of unanswered questions that we'll try to tap into here during our discussion, things we don't know yet, uh, and lots of records that remain restricted in both American and foreign archives. There's certainly much future academic work to be done on this topic. My role in today's event is made infinitely easier by the assembly of three of the most serious researchers that I know. Uh, between us, I think and hope we can do an adequate job of, of covering the events that led to the Paris Peace Accords, uh, some of the key personalities involved, and also from a, a wide variety of viewpoints, American, Vietnamese, and others. To bring structure to our conversation, I propose to approach our topic of seeking peace in Vietnam in three parts. Uh, what the Paris Peace Accords meant at the time, uh, that is the past, what we've learned since, and what they mean today, that is sort of bringing us up to the present, and also uh, what we don't know yet, the unanswered questions, the areas for debate, uh, future potential areas of research, that is the future. I admitted to David offline that after I wrote this up, it seemed like a dystopian version of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol <laughs> when I saw it in front of me on the page. However, uh, you know, let me reassure you that any similarities are purely coincidental. Uh, everyone here has something to say about all three of our segments. So I propose a sort of round robin approach uh, to help minimize crosstalk on Zoom. On each of these three parts, followed by an open discussion and, and, and Q&A, will come in uh, toward the end of our panel. So you know, taking these one at a time, what did the Paris Peace Accords mean, uh, mean at the time, uh, 50 years ago? Uh, David, you've done an awful lot of work on the background, the events that led up to there, and I feel like there's all kinds of my favorite subjects that we could get into, whether it's the Laos Accords in 1962, the consequences of leaving Saigon out at an early stage of the talks, uh, the structure that uh, Nixon inherited, the private public talks in Paris, uh, but you take it the direction that you want to uh, in terms of what's some of the background that we need to understand how we got to this point in 1973. 
I think from my perspective, it's fundamental to reflect on how difficult Nixon's domestic, political, and strategic environment was when he was inaugurated in 1969. There's that sense, both at the time and in retrospect, that as Nixon put it, I had no good choices coming into office. And indeed, on the one hand, there is, especially in Congress, significant and a rising anti-war faction that is looking to cut appropriations, restrict operations in Indochina. And Nixon has a keen sense of that domestic limit. At the same time, he understands a majority of Americans are against precipitate withdrawal from Vietnam. They want Americans out of the war. They may look at the war as a mistake, but they still see American credibility is on the line in Vietnam. And they still want something of an American victory. They want the Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam, to survive. So that when Nixon starts surveying his options in 69, there is this internal struggle of when and how to begin withdrawing American troops unilaterally from the war, but also how to pursue peace to get an agreement to help continue American aid to the Republic of Vietnam but also retain the ability to use American air power to perhaps coerce or get Hanoi to stop its aggression against the South. I think on one hand, there's a lot of optimism within the administration, within American allies in early 69. There is a sense that Hanoi is still reeling from the 68 Tet Offensives, that America's ally, the Republic of Vietnam, is relatively legitimate it's democratic in many ways, far so, far more so than North Vietnam. And it's enjoying a bit of popularity and a brief spirit of unity after the Tet Offensives. And so with good reason and a fair amount of optimism, both President Nixon and his South Vietnamese counterpart, President Nguyen Van Thieu, embark on a policy of de-Americanizing or Vietnamizing the war. And that's the path Nixon starts in 69, and it's a path that will ultimately shape the contours of the negotiations that will follow and what leads up to the Accords. But to briefly sketch out the trajectory of Nixon, I would also add, though, that there is a popular sense within the White House that Nixon's options are increasingly narrowing. After the Cambodian incursion in 1970, there's a real sense that congressional dissent is inexorable, that it will continue to rise and limit what the White House can do in Vietnam, how fast it can withdraw troops. And then Lamson 719 in 1971, as well as 71 presidential election in South Vietnam, in many ways underscores, I think, for Nixon and especially Henry Kissinger that Vietnamization may not necessarily bear the fruits that it's wanting in South Vietnam, so that they need to seek other means, particularly diplomatic means, to get a settlement to both perhaps get Hanoi to restrain itself against the South, but also, especially in 1972, to build support in Congress to continue the appropriations, the economic appropriations, the economic aid, the military aid, that's essential to making Vietnamization work. But nevertheless, I'd say by late 1972, especially as the elections in the House and the Senate don't go perhaps as Nixon would have wished, uh, linebacker two, something I'm sure we'll talk about later on, begins to fan further dissent in the Senate, that Nixon needs an agreement to continue to provide that aid that Nguyen Van Thieu and others see as absolutely essential the survival of South Vietnam, but nevertheless, his options, the windows close, just as the circumstances like North Vietnamese will and the control and dominance of the South at large swaths of the South after the 72 offensive. All of these things, I think, limit Nixon's ability to achieve a durable peace, but nevertheless, through 1972, is intent on achieving and searching for peace with honor. Now, Tom, uh, the rest of us haven't written a biography of Henry Kissinger, um, and so you've you, you spent some time studying the the, pers- the key personalities at work, uh, the opportunities that they offered, but also the, the limitations uh, in, implicit in some of those relationships. 
talk to us a little bit of, sort of in responding to David, but also you know adding on and talking a little bit about some of the key personalities. Uh, who, who are these people? You know, who are involved in the search of peace? And, and and how did their relationships both create opportunities as well as establish limitations about what was possible? Well, first off, let me just say, David's got a book coming out that I think does an excellent job of talking about how Vietnamization comes about and, and how these, these choices do indeed get limited. I learned a lot uh, in addition to what I knew already about Kissinger. I learned a lot about that direction and that momentum uh, from his book. Um, when I studied Kissinger, one of the things that, of course, comes through with Kissinger is, I think, both intellectually and I think also as a judgment about uh, a diplomacy in the political process, Kissinger always favored some type of formal settlement of the Vietnam War. This is fairly consistent all the way through. And I, I think in this sense, he's different uh, from his uh, the man who gives him his authority, Richard Nixon, um, who politically is, I think, looking for peace with honor, but I think could have accepted uh, different variations on that, something more like a Korea frozen conflict, something along those lines. Uh, but Kissinger is looking for a settlement, and he's partially uh, arguing that a settlement will both also, not only will it be a good thing um, uh, to uh, for America's foreign policy, but it will also uh, help in reconciling the d divisions within the United States, the polarization that had occurred that makes our contemporary polariza polarization sometimes look minor compared to the, the degree of violence and and um, um, hatreds that the Vietnam War had, had brought to American society. And um, so I think Kissinger does have this sense. And, and it's one reason why he's not as enthusiastic enthusiastic about Vietnamization and, in fact, uh, criticizes it um, and, and suggests that it will only lead to a sort of unilateral uh, withdrawal of American forces and, and, and ultimately perhaps even a defeat. So he is he is from the very beginning interested in this. Um, Kissinger is given authority by Nixon to conduct secret negotiations with his counterpart, Le Duc Tho, uh, well, first uh, beforehand uh, with other Vietnamese officials, but then later with Le Duc Tho. And uh, Kissinger will pursue um, an agreement. And uh, over the period of time, and I record this in my biography, he is at various times optimistic that he's going to get some sort of settlement, always at times thinking North Vietnam's about to talk. Nixon's a bit frustrated with this. He thinks Kissinger is overly optimistic, constantly about the possibilities of a settlement. Um, gradually, the Americans are worn down in part by the North Vietnamese. The one crucial issue that they don't give on is the idea that they must depose uh, two as president. This is one thing that the North Vietnamese are demanding in 1969. It will be the one concession they will ultimately make that will allow the Paris Peace Treaty to actually come to fruition. Um, I think Nixon also, in, in, in a way different from Kissinger, also sees that he's elected in part to end the war in Vietnam so that he will, in fact, be judged in 1972 by how he ends the war in Vietnam. So for him, it's also a matter of politics. It's a matter of how he's going to be seen by the American electorate. And so it, it, it also is, it plays that role for him. I, I think ultimately both of them come together, but they have slightly different emphasis in what they think is most crucial about the Vietnam War and about what how the United States should go about ending it. Uh, ultimately, I think uh, this will, will bring, um, in October of 1972, the first inklings that there is a settlement possible. It will, of course, um, go through a torturous uh, three-month period uh, there of, of, uh, of both hopes and then dreams dashed, including uh, the infamous or uh, the, the Christmas bombing of North Vietnam that takes place. So all of this is is partly the um, element of trying to get a settlement that preserves American foreign policy credibility and also the possibility for the survival of the Republic of Vietnam. And I stress the possibility because I think from a very early stage, it's seen that it's unlikely that the United States can achieve the type of a permanent commitment to the security of South Vietnam that it had managed to achieve with, say, South Korea. But that said, we uh, we can discuss all of these things over the course of the next uh, hour and a half. Well, thanks. Uh, Jay, what are we missing? Uh, because I think we all, um, uh, as researchers, try to oppose uh, approach topics with as many different viewpoints as possible. 
And I think it's 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 normal that Americans tend to overestimate their own influence on almost every topic and tend to un underestimate everyone else's influence, uh, no matter the subject. And so, you know, what are we missing here in terms of the consideration? And what did you perhaps Americans not realize at the time about Vietnamese perspectives? Uh, and uh, what what would you add to uh, to bring us a, a rounder discussion here on what the the peace accords meant at the time? Well, you're precisely correct, Luke. And I wanted to follow up on Tom's discussion of the personalities. And I wanted to take a look at the two uh, main uh, Vietnamese personalities, which have been Le Duc Thu on the North Vietnamese side, who was leading the negotiations, and then President Thu on the South Vietnamese side. And while the North Vietnamese have written extensively and published a great deal on sort of their strategy and, and different tactics uh, during the Paris Peace Accords, the one person who never wrote anything uh, other than something I'm going to mention here in a second, was Le Doc Tho. But over time, having read um, uh, some of the things that people have written about him, I'm convinced that he, by late 72, had become as invested as Kissinger on completing the Accords. I mean, he'd been working on this since 1968, as you well know. Um, and at some point, I think he was looking just to sort of complete the agreement, uh, mainly just get the Americans out to sort of get take a pause in the war, give North Vietnam a chance to rebuild itself. But as you look at those two, as you look at what they've written, the, the Paris Peace Accords for the Vietnamese came down to two core principles, uh, which were dramatically opposite on both sides. And the first one was that North Vietnamese troops would absolutely remain in South Vietnam. There was no way unless uh, Allied forces militarily kicked them out that they were ever going to agree to withdraw their troops. Second one, which they were a little more flexible on, is really on the shape of the post-war government, how the government would look after a peace agreement was signed. And the Polar Bureau would really come down to uh, three options, which I told this to Kissinger uh, years ago. Uh, basically, they the first option was, and it was their best option, was that the Americans withdraw, they would overthrow Chu on the way out the door, a coalition government would be formed at all levels, and that would shortly uh, you know, present bringing the communists who would then merge with North Vietnam. Second level was the Americans would leave, there would be so the two governments, both the national and the local level. And then the third option, which is the one that Kissinger actually got, the least one that they wanted, was that the um, what they called both governments, which was the Tew government and the PRG, would remain as is, but there would be a, uh, a commission formed to hold elections and to do their things. And so um, it's a testimony to uh, Kissinger's negotiation skills that he was able to achieve the sort of the lowest goal the Polar Bureau had, despite um, you know uh, negotiating under some very difficult circumstances. Now, for two, on the other hand, and he had been uh, involved uh, with South Vietnamese, developing South Vietnamese negotiation ta uh, tactics since February 65, the number one thing for them was they wanted all communists out. All the communists had to leave and that there would be no uh, coalition government and there would be no allowing the communists into the government unless they agreed to participate in elections um, in which they could then win some seats. So what you have is two core principles that each side was diametrically opposed to agreeing to. Um, and I think that those set the, the tone for the Paris Peace Accords and was ultimately its downfall. That provides a pretty good overview um, and uh, to get us started. And I, I heard you talking, I scratched down a few notes. Um, I, I think I'll I'll give I'll, I'll give you my toughest question right now that I had planned for the whole panel. What did the Paris Peace Accords achieve? Not achieve? And do you think something else might have been possible? And before I, I turn it over to you in any whatever order you want to go, I like the illusion during panel one. I think it was by Neil Ferguson that foreign policy is often a choice between evils, you know, bad and worse. And at the time, it's not always clear which is worse. Uh, and in hindsight, you know, we're looking at we're reconstructing the past based on records and interviews, and we think, why didn't they do a better job? You know, the th it was black and white. There was good. There was bad. Why did they? Why would anyone choose bad? You know, if they had a choice not to choose bad. And so uh, that's the next question I'd offer you. Probably the toughest one that I have on my list is, what did these accords achieve? 
What did they not achieve? And 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 was could they have been more uh, than the limited accords that they were? And I'll turn it whichever order you want to go in. I'll just start off and just say that um, uh, both my dear friend Pierre Oslin and John Carlin have both separately written, and I agree with them 100 percent that the Paris Peace Accords was the best bad deal they could possibly achieve. Um, and it sounds like that's an awful thing, but uh, as I was told many years ago, diplomacy is the art of the possible. And I think this was the best bad deal that they could have achieved. The problem is, is that both sides, the US side, the North Vietnamese side, saw the Paris Peace Accords in vastly different terms. And those terms were so diametrically opposed again, that ultimately made them unwordable. The, the North Vietnamese saw it as this, or at least told over the world that this was a tremendous victory, whereas the Americans believed it was peace with honor. The South Vietnamese had their own opinion, which I think everyone can guess. I uh, want to echo uh, Jay's point there that I think it was probably the best bad deal. Um, it, it is fascinating to go back. Um, I spent some time uh, watching uh, Henry Kissinger's press conference um, trying to explain the deal um, in January uh, January 27th or 24th of 1973, when he had uh, unlimited air time, really. And he kept talking about how the deal involved the flat prohibition of the reinforcement of North Vietnamese, the flat prohibition of foreign troops in Laos and Cambodia, and the flat prohibition of crossing the de demilitarized zone. I was thinking to myself, well, yeah, all of these flat prohibitions, and there was absolutely no enforcement mechanism. This was, in, in that sense, it was a deal based on, uh, at least from the American side, a series of hopes, uh, hope that North Vietnam uh, might indeed shift its emphasis from uh, military conquest of the South to some sort of peaceful attempt to take South Vietnam through elections or a, a more normal process, or uh, it would devote itself to rebuilding, a uh, hope that China and the Soviet Union would try to restrain North Vietnam from any military activities, and that North Vietnam would gleefully accept American money in the manner of the Marshall Plan and rebuilding and um, forswear military operations. But that was the hope on the American side. Uh, on the Vietnamese side, it just seems to me that the, the, the determination or the sense that they had of, of, of wanting to, uh, of keeping their uh, soldiers in there, of taking a pause uh, and judging then uh, what, what could be achieved subsequently was certainly there. The one great achievement, of course, of the Accords was getting the American prisoners of war back. Um, and that was one of the absolute central objectives of getting this agreement, was getting the POWs back. And that did provide for a moment, um, although quickly eclipsed by Watergate, it did provide for a moment of Americans to celebrate together as these men uh, returned from uh, what was an extraordinary ordeal that they had suffered. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, I would agree that it was the best of bad deals that could be made. I, I agree. Hey, what, are we, what are we leaving out? What's that, Luke? Say, what, what are we leaving out? We must be missing something. Well, I think it, it's hard to imagine better. Like thinking about counterfactuals, what should Nixon and Kissinger have done differently? It, just in my mind, it's hard to imagine a better deal. We have to remember that Vietnamization had already accomplished Hanoi's chief negotiating demand of a complete unilateral U.S. withdrawal. Nixon comes in with what well, become 550,000 U.S. personnel in Vietnam, and there's around 25,000 left by the time his first term ends. And so that principal demand of North Vietnam has already been met. And as Nixon also realizes, despite winning in a landslide, He's facing a hostile Congress coming into the next term. And this will also constrict his options. And so Hanoi knows that, South Vietnam knows that, and Nixon knows it's going to be a hard fight going forward. And so in many ways, the accords represent the best of what they could have achieved or hoped to negotiate, especially after Hanoi dropped the demand that you resign to get a deal. But on far as what, what it didn't succeed or did not achieve, and I think that in many ways what Nixon and Kissinger had hoped, and since they're hoping something will come out of the Accords, is that it will sustain American political will 
continue at least financing to preserve the possibility. And I think Tom's right in suggesting the possibility. There's no certainty here and hasn't been a certainty since early on in the war that South Vietnam would be persevered or would preserve. But nonetheless, the possibility rested on domestic support. And perhaps even without Watergate, it seems that the odds of Nixon being able to sustain the money and the resolve necessary to keep funneling air power and dollars to Saigon, it seems like it's going to be difficult no matter what. And so the Accords did not achieve the, the ability to sustain U.S. domestic support for Saigon. And Luke, to follow up on David's point, uh, there was another hope, which was that um, North Vietnam would, quote, turn inward and begin to rebuild its society, as Le Duc Tell repeatedly told Kissinger, that they would turn away from this fanatical desire to reunite the country. Um, it would give some time for South Vietnam to sort of continue to build itself. Um, and so that was also something that never achieved because uh, the infiltration continued um, at a rather high level, despite the ban on infiltration. Uh, the failure to withdraw North Vietnamese troops from Laos and Cambodia, that, and there was another hope there that those two countries could find a way to negotiate a settlement, and overall peace would come to all of Southeast uh, Asia. So there was a lot of other hopes um, that were unfortunately not achieved by the Paris Peace Accords. Good point. Um, to follow up uh, on some themes that, that you all touched on and, and came up in the, the, the earlier panel today, just as a follow up to, to all what you've all said, you know, one of the things I enjoy about teaching a U.S. history survey uh, on a college campus is, um, you know, we're often reminded by the media that we're more divided now than we ever have been before. Um, and I remember I think it was one of my first uh, sections of freshmen back in almost 20 years ago. Um, when this had come up in the context of the 2004 presidential election and, you know, hands shot up, you know, all over the classroom. And I, said, I said, well, you know, what, what about the Civil War? You know, what about the 1960s? Um, and so in terms of things that we didn't achieve in the Paris Accords, in terms of limitations that Nixon and Kissinger had, uh, on their designs, you could talk about the limitations of Nixon's domestic position. You could talk about the effect to which Congress and the funding being cut off in 1973 was a factor or not. I mean, I could also point you to Nixon tapes in late 1972 and early 73, but Nixon was quite happy to be done with it and hope not to go back, or at least in that moment. Or the the, the fact that the, the agreement that resulted failed to more comprehensively include the whole Indo-Chinese region uh, as a as sort of roadmap for peace, because uh, earlier in the panel, it came up Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge and all that. And without going too deep down any one rabbit hole, talking about some of the constraints that were upon this process, I think it's important for our audience, you know, many of whom might not have been around back then, to get a sense for what the environment was really like at the time. So any of these subjects or others that you might want to touch on in terms of the constraints and limitations placed upon the process, uh, please go right ahead. I'd like to just um, uh, add a, a constraint that in some sense was self-imposed. Uh, in the morning conversation, there was a discussion of South Korea, the comparison between Korea and Vietnam. And uh, one aspect of the Paris agreements that uh, certainly played a key role was that the United States did get out of Vietnam in its entirety in a way that it did not withdraw after the armistice uh, in Korea um, and kept forces there that served in some sense as a tripwire and a, a preventing uh, subsequent North Korean aggression. Uh, in, the, in, in South Vietnam, they did get out. The United States did get out. And that was partly because the issue of the prisoners of war had become so central uh, to the negotiating strategy of the, uh, and also to, to encouraging public support. Um, the Nixon uh, presidency had emphasized the treatment of the prisoners. North Vietnam had, had used the prisoners as bargaining tools, but also had treated them. Uh, it did not adhere to the Geneva Convention. It had uh, uh, behaved in ways that um, created a great deal of hardship and I think that became a, a way of, of, of regaining domestic support in the United States. So in effect, the prisoners were hostages to a full and complete American withdrawal from Vietnam that did 
create a difference between the, the Korean and Vietnamese situations that ultimately worked to the detriment of the survival of South Vietnam. I think in retrospect, we can see that more clearly, but we can see how different forces work together to make that uh, to uh, make the prisoners become absolutely a central an issue so that Nixon act, uh, had to get all of them back and promise, in effect, to withdraw all American soldiers as a result. I think Tom's right. I mean, uh, one of the big uh, things that President Hu wanted Americans, he wanted a, an American residual presence, much like Korea, much like Germany, much like other places. Um, and I think that that failure to keep some sort of American firepower in South Vietnam, which by 72, the offensive, there was, you know, was basically naval and air power, uh, that failure to keep some American presence in South Vietnam, whether it was intelligence, logistics was huge, uh, air power was huge, uh, was probably one of the biggest, um, I don't want to say mistakes, but one of the biggest constraints in the Nixon administration. Yeah, in terms of a few other constraints, I don't want to belabor the domestic point, but switching to North Vietnam, uh, echoing some of Pierre's comments in the first session, they are, in many ways, one of the best fighting forces in the world. And he's right in pointing out how strong and resolved they were in the Americanization, the early phase of the war. But in the Vietnamization era, I think we see continued evolution and adaptation, especially as they move towards greater and greater conventional firepower. The Nixon administration saw that in Lamson 719, the level of coordination, the arms they're using, the artillery and the like all point to a significant military threat, both to Vietnamization, but the survival of South Vietnam as well. And to take that constraint and look at the other side, and 68 through 70, I think are pretty good years for the Republic of Vietnam, but beginning in late 1970, 1971, you start to see what I call Vietnamization's frailties, economic problems, political problems, military problems, and that these problems continue to manifest themselves in ways that show that Vietnamization was not as strong or as durable as Nixon and Thieu had originally hoped when they started that program in 69. And I think in many ways that points our attention back to the importance of the accords to try to overcome, as Kissinger I think would have seen it, to overcome Vietnamization's frailties and try to eke out something or a possibility for South Vietnamese survival. Yeah, you know, so kind of going from there and then kind of then to hindsight, reflecting back on the Paris Peace Accords and, and the years since, kind of the second phase of our conversation, what we've learned since, uh, what, they, what they mean today, and I think there's any number of ways to comment here. I think we learned an awful lot about the Sino-Vietnamese relationship, the communist world as a whole, uh, the U.S. hesitancy to get into, quote, another Vietnam, uh, which we still hear about in recent years, uh, how Vietnam affected uh, what's been called uh, the American way of war going forward, how presidential leadership, um, media relations have changed when it comes to sort of credibility uh, of, of presidential statements. Um, so, so kind of giving you lots of ideas there to dive off of as well as your own. Um, you know, what have we learned since since then? So what what is the hindsight that we can bring to the conversation? Well, I think uh, President Chu was right in the sense that if the North Vietnamese were refusing to withdraw their troops, if they were refusing to discuss uh, with South Vietnamese representative directly, but those were key indicators that North Vietnam was not interested in peace. They only wanted the Americans out uh, so they could continue the war at some point in the future. And I remember when the Afghan Accords were being um, being discussed, and I, I thought to myself, the same thing is happening here. The, the Taliban are just negotiating to get us out so they can, once the American firepower is gone, then they'll have free reign. Uh, and so I think that uh, as we look back now, and again, the North Vietnamese have published a great deal, they're pretty blatantly obvious and honest about it that it was, as the Ho Chi Minh said, you know, puppets out. I mean, Americans out, puppets collapsed. And I think that's the key, one of the key takeaways uh, that President Xi was right. If they weren't going to negotiate in this way, then they weren't negotiating in good faith. 
Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent point you raised. I remember the first time I went to Vietnam and he say, you know, the Vietnam War. I said, no, the American War. Uh, and so, you know, perspective is everything about how we approach these issues. We're calling these the Paris Peace Accords, but it was really, you know, a negotiation, a negotiated sort of almost sort of unilateral withdrawal of American forces. Uh, so terminology is, is important. And so you bring you bring a good perspective there. Uh, but Tom or David want to jump in. What are some of the things that we've learned since then? I think we have learned. Uh, one thing we did have learned is is the degree uh, to which, on in, in many respects, uh, people who supported the war were right about certain things, um, as well as people who opposed the war. And one of the things people who supported the war were right about was that it that North Vietnam was guiding South Vietnam. Uh, uh, this the insurgency. It was not a genuine. Uh, Viet Cong insurgency against uh, the the South Vietnamese government. The North Vietnam Hanoi dictated the National Liberation Front, and that it was uh, in effect also with substantial aid from Russia and China, and that in that sense it was part of the Cold War, um, and it was not simply a Vietnamese civil war, but it was also part of the Cold War. And we know the extent to which Russia and China provided enormous amounts of assistance that enabled North Vietnam really to prevail and to, to survive during its conflict with the South. We know, in that sense, we know a lot more about the, the Vietnamese, uh, although not completely, we know a lot more about the degree to which um, Hanoi really directed the struggle and was directing it from the very beginning. And I think in that sense, um, uh, even if the people who supported the war were right. It, 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 uh, the people who opposed the war, on the other hand, probably were right in the sense that the war ultimately did not mean as much as uh, many who supported the war did, namely the idea that uh, the loss in Vietnam would have terrible consequences throughout the world, the dominoes, this sort of thing. So in effect, um, both sides have had been humbled, I think, by some of the things we have learned since, that it, uh, on, the, on the one hand, that uh, indeed it was that many respects American and uh, what what the uh, Washington said about the, the Vietnamese communists was correct. On the other hand, the implications that it um, uh, suggested would happen as a result of the loss of South Vietnam were, were dramatically overstated. And just to continue that thought, Tom, I, I think it plays to, and the Vietnam War as a whole should reemphasize a need for humility and approaching foreign policy and events and an understanding, especially in hindsight, how complex events can be and the need to bring in lots of different perspectives. I think that's one of the benefits of the research that a lot of scholars are doing at the moment, that we're hearing more Vietnamese, Chinese, Soviet perspectives on the war. And in many ways that reemphasizes just how difficult the decisions are, that Nixon was right when he said he had no easy choices. And certainly, the longer I look at Vietnam in any stage of the war, rather than finding easy or clear answers with the benefit of hindsight, it's complex. And if anything, that again, in my mind, points toward a need for greater humility and circumspection in regards to foreign policy. Luke, I wanted to uh, just touch on one other thing, and that is um, uh, the linebacker two bombings in the sense that uh, the use of American firepower sort of the kill them until they stop sort of thing is 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 dramatically effective and can and can sway the thing. So um, I know a lot of people, the Americans always say, and I'm, I remember talking to Kissinger about this directly, was that, you know, we had bombed them uh, and to make them and force them to come back to the negotiating table, or if you take a counterfactual, as Necroponte said, bombed them until they accepted our concessions. Um, on the other hand, the Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese, look at it and they called the Dien Bin Phu in the air, that they had taken the Americans' best punch. They had gone back and shot down all these planes and they had done other things. And so I think that they're both sides have overhyped the, the linebacker two bombing to, to make it, uh, to uh, buttress their own point of view. And a couple of things I wanted just to point out is, for example, by the end of 72, Hanoi only had about a third of its air defenses that it had in 1967. A lot of their SAM units had gone south to support the uh, Easter Offensive. Um, the other thing that we claim is that, well, they were out of missiles, which is why they were you know, crying to come back to the, the conference table. That is also incorrect. They were out of assembled missiles. They had all the pieces of it. 
And the third thing I wanted to mention is that um, the SAM-2 missile technology that they were using was from the 50s, the North Vietnamese had tweaked it a dozen different ways to make it more effective. But there was a SAM-3 missile uh, regiment sitting across the border in China that wasn't able to get into the fray that had been in the fray would have caused a lot more American casualties. So, um, you know, one of the things I think we need to at some point recognize in terms of both the Paris Peace Accords and Afghanistan and other future wars is that there, um, you have to be very careful to um, overstate the limit, to overstate the effects of American firepower um, on forcing people to do things uh, in terms of peace accord. Good point. Uh, you know, another topic that has hasn't been discussed yet today is is also the role of the draft. If anyone wants to comment on that at some point, but but let me also throw out um, uh, something else that came up in the earlier panel today. And I, I, which that wasn't really explored very deeply, but I would present to us here in terms of uh, what might be the proper context, geopolitical, global, uh, geo, uh, strategic context to see Vietnam. And in the first panel, it was the relationship between uh, the, the peace accords between the Vietnam War and the opening to China, or uh, as a broader part of detente or opportunities that presented themselves in the Middle East to uh, to sort of take control and, 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 you know, remove or limit, reduce Soviet influence in the Middle East. And I I set up this next question because, you know, when I was researching this biography of Henry Cabot Lodge, who had all kinds of sort of interesting notes to himself in his files. And, you know, sometimes these things were clearly written for the record and, and wanted to guide researchers a certain way. But I remember one, I couldn't figure out the date on it, but I guess it was mid-70s, clearly after the Peace Accords, but not that much after, where he sort of argues to his reader, which I suppose was me at that moment, and I don't know how many people saw it before me, he sort of argued that the Vietnam War in his sort of broader geopolitical sense was a success. And his rationale was that... um, uh, that not only the opening of China and detente in the Middle East, but as I think his argument is certainly controversial, was the idea that every, all the top policymakers argued that a war between the United States and China was basically inevitable at a certain point. And, and that what the Vietnam War showed, a protracted conflict, that it showed uh, the degree of American commitment and the high cost that such a war would be to the Chinese if this happened. So while an interesting, you know, counterfactual, I certainly don't deal with it in the Lodge biography, um, but there was a lot of sort of Monday morning quarterbacking that went on, you know, after 1973. And so I would submit this to you also for your comment. And I think of the draft issue uh, also in terms of if we were fighting this war at all again with what was then called an all-volunteer army, how it might have been different. How if we'd use, as Jay said, you know, linebacker to uh, strength, much earlier in the war, you know, what, what, that came up also earlier in the panel. Would that have made much of a difference? So here, here's a few more produ- provocative ideas to chew on and, uh, for your own, for your comment. Can I jump in on uh, on both of these? Uh, the interesting thing is, of course, many people think that the development of the volunteer army allowed uh, Washington to use force more readily because uh, the draft was so central to the opposition to the war that the absence of a draft uh, reduced the degree of anti-war sentiment. Now, the Iraq War showed that that's not always the case, that, that, a, that a war that seems to drag on, even if fought by volunteers, can become distinctly unpopular and become a, a, a problem for domestic uh, for a domestic uh, public. Uh, but I think uh, it is the case that uh, one of the most consequential effects of the Vietnam War was the end of the draft and the end of of that, and that has had other aspects to it. I think in terms of of how Americans see their relationship to their country and 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 making for a difference in in perhaps in in uh, levels of of uh, sentiment, national sentiment, patriotic sentiment. Um, but to go to the other question you posed about seeing the Vietnam War as a success, I will say anecdotally. Um, uh, for another project I was working on, I had a conversation recently with an Australian diplomat who, of course, um, echoed Lee Kuan Yew, the famous Singapore prime minister, who said that, you know, from from their point of view, the Vietnam War was a success because it bought time for the rest of Southeast Asia to strengthen itself 
and prevent the dominoes from falling, that, the, the, that had the United States withdrawn in 1965 and given up, uh, that situation might have been very different. Indonesia might have collapsed, uh, the sort of thing Mark Moyer was talking about a bit there, too, that there would have been a very different strategic situation, and that, in fact, uh, the United States had, through its commitment in Vietnam, preserved uh, a non-communist Southeast Asia. Um, I told him, though, that any argument on the side of the uh, uh, Pacific that the Vietnam War was a success is still a hard sell, um, given its consequences and its uh, what it what it did to American society. But it is it is interesting that that's still out there from a, a, a sort of geopolitical framework and all the rest that people um, from different perspectives in different parts of the world see the war in different ways. Yeah, certainly in terms of if you're looking at a game of chess, I think any any chess player would gladly give up a pawn for a rook or a knight. Um, uh, now we're talking also about human lives, you know, a certain point in terms of policymakers. Uh, and, and also, I think, think um, uh, a, a couple of other unintended consequences uh, in the last 50 years, certainly bilateral relations between the United States and Vietnam today are, are better than any point in my lifetime. Um, they've become our in a sense, one of our uh, closest friends, or at least frenemies, uh, with uh, being on the periphery of, of China and the, the new containment strategy. Not to mention the fact, I was thinking the other day, my, my primary care physician is Vietnamese origin. My students are Vietnamese. You can't go anywhere in Orange County without running into Vietnamese. And in a sense, it was sort of Vietnam's loss was America's gain in terms of, um, you know, Vietnamese Americans have added certainly richly to our own national cultural estuary, you know, to really bring it forward 50 years later. Uh, but these are just sort of th random thoughts that occurred to me while I was getting ready. But uh, other con another uh, controversial idea we haven't talked about is the, the, the way that Vietnam changed the relationship between the White House and the media, you know, is, is another factor I think we get down. But again, I just throw out a bunch of ideas for you to potentially comment on if you'd like to. I'll come back around to the geostrategic context. One of the things we don't often think about as far as the operating context that Nixon, Kissinger, and Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird as well are looking at is a perceived sense, and it's something the Johnson White House and the Nixon White House shared, is a sense of rising neo-isolationism in the United States, that especially after the Americanization of the war, there are rising voices in Congress, I'm thinking Senator Mike Mansfield, Senator Fulbright, that are calling not just for reductions, if not withdrawal from Vietnam, but also reductions from NATO. And by 1969, especially after the traumas of 68, something Professor Ferguson and others talked about in the prior panel, that America's allies are uncertain about U.S. resolve, not in Vietnam, or not just in Vietnam, which for many of them is a minor domino, but in terms of NATO, it's a relationship, alliance with ANZUS, Australia, New Zealand as well. And so I think one of the things Nixon and Laird and Kissinger as well all appreciate is that a precipitate withdrawal from Vietnam will have credibility issues, not just with America's enemies, but its allies who are very nervous about American actions in 69. And so I think that in many ways, Vietnamization, the Nixon doctrine, as well as the diplomacy towards detente and the opening of China is in many ways an effort to reassure American allies that yes, it may not be possible to achieve what America wants in South Vietnam, but it's not going to be due to a lack of American trying to preserve South Vietnam. So that the responsibility is ultimately back on the Vietnamese and Vietnamese parties to work out their, their future in the Civil War. And I do think that their actions in 69 and 70 helped buy time for America's allies to adjust to the limits of American power. And thereby, when Vietnam, South Vietnam does fall in 75, it's not the shock America's allies that it would have been had South Vietnam fallen in such a dramatic fashion in 68 or 69. That's a great point that David brings up. And uh, the discussion about American credibility, which I'll talk back to you, Luke, is um, was one of the central themes that Nixon and Kissinger's you know, design for the Paris Peace Accords and for their policy on Vietnam. 
And I've always sort of wrestled with that one uh, in terms of whether they were right, whether it was overblown, whether it was underblown. I'm sort of curious what everyone else thinks in terms of American credibility and the reasons for Vietnam. Credibility is one of those fascinating concepts because it seems to constantly being tested and then it's lost and then it's won again and all of that. And uh, it's clearly something that is deeply held by decision makers at times. And the, 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 the question of how other countries actually perceive the United States, I think, is uh, for historians, is just an ongoing uh, question. I, I was thinking about that uh, in the context of more contemporary events. Uh, the argument, for example, that um, Putin would have um, gone into Ukraine or would not have gone into Ukraine had the United States not uh, precipitously withdrawn from Afghanistan and sort of shown itself uh, sort of not even not being willing to maintain even a minimal military presence there and willing to accept a rather humiliating defeat. Uh, these types of things, that that type of argument is going to be an ongoing one. I I think there's no question from studying diplomatic documents that foreign leaders do tell American lead, tell American presidents that credibility is important. Um, now, sometimes they do that for their own domestic purposes as well. Um, and how much uh, they're telling us something we want to believe always comes into play as well. But I think I think Nixon did believe, I, I actually think that he was more concerned well, that's about foreign credibility than what would be the consequences of a disaster in Vietnam for American public opinion. That in effect, I think he believed that a, 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 a disastrous defeat in Vietnam would discourage Americans and would have an impact on the ability of a president to maintain the type of foreign commitments that he believed were necessary. And I think in that sense, one of the biggest uh, issues of credibility that I I, I I think from my own sort of looking at Nixon and Kissinger that was with the American people, that that in the end he believed um, one of uh, uh, Kissinger's uh, mentors, um, Fritz Kramer, wrote a memo early on in the administration saying that uh, the people are are not generous with losers. So uh, that in, in effect, they 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 resent defeat much more than they than than people believe and, and and in effect saying that if you're defeated in Vietnam you're going to pay for it um and it's going to be a real it's going to have a real consequence for your ability to carry out foreign policy and I know Kissinger forwarded that memo and I know Nixon thought yes he's right about this that this is something that uh will be uh that that I I share in that belief but uh that's that that's my take on it Luke. Yeah, I suppose another way to interpret that is 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 an is um I think Kissinger refers to Kramer on the tapes as my right wing friend in the Pentagon. Uh, I think another way to reinterpret that, it, it, another since we're talking about controversial ideas, is that perhaps Vietnam was bigger in American domestic policy than it was foreign policy, or at least it it did you know became so at a certain point. And I I'm not sure many people have commented on it you know in in that sense. Um, I, I will tell you, we do have questions come in, so we're not reaching complete radio silence. Uh, we are we are going out on the airwaves and, and, and reaching someone. So we will get to we've got about a half dozen questions that we'll get to here in just a minute. Um, but um, let me sort of transition here from the second part of our conversation to our third part. And, and if you were waiting to chime in there on any other issue, feel free to do so in, in just a minute. So where do we stand today? Um, what do we not know? Uh, what are the unanswered questions? What are the future potential areas of research? I suppose if Donald Rumsfeld were with us, he would he would say it was the what are the known unknowns? You know about the Paris Peace Accords and the research that goes on here. Certainly, I, I, you know, easy low hanging fruit. We all struggle with access in our own archives. Certainly, access in Chinese archives, Russian archives, uh, in Hanoi, Vietnamese archives would be essential to having a fuller understanding of this subject in the future. Um, but where do you all came out on this? You know, uh, wh wh what do we have yet to learn on the subject? Well, I think um, even though, as I mentioned earlier, that the North Vietnamese, the Hanoi has published a great deal on their sort of their strategy and behind the scenes maneuvering on the Paris Peace Accords, we know almost nothing about what Le Ductel actually thought. Um, the only thing that I've ever seen, and this, this is just a recent find in the South, the old uh, RVN archives, 
was a speech that he had given um, right after the Paris Peace Accords were signed in February of 73. Uh, later, he had given a speech internally to uh, what was just termed the missile troops, where he talks about some of the lessons learned from the Paris Peace Accords. And I won't go into the whole document, but the three main things that he talks about was um, how he had used different strategies to affect Kissinger's mindset. You remember the very famous one, he comes back uh, in the January of 73 after he had gone to Hanoi and we bombed him and he starts slamming the table about how I, you, know, you bombed me as soon as I got home. And he fully admits this was uh, merely theater. He is doing this to unsettle Kissinger. Um, and the second thing that I want that he mentions is that he had fooled Kissinger on the DMZ. And then the third thing is that Kissinger had fooled him on mine, mine uh, removal. And so this is the only insight we have into late October is this captured document where he talks about these things. Um, so I think we still need uh, a great deal more access in terms of what was the discussions internally within the Politburo uh, as to what they were going to do, how they're going to respond to various American um, proposals. Yeah, certainly on that point, we have uh, thousands of hours of Nixon tapes, and even of those, uh, 500 hours have still never been released. But we certainly don't have, you know, lead up toe tapes or Mao tapes or <laughs> diaries or, you know, any anything of that sort to give us a clue. What were they actually not written for the record? What did they really think at the time? It's a, it's a good question. Tom or David? I think one of the things I would really like to know is how people on the ground felt. And this may be an unknowable but I'd like to know how both those in the North, but especially those in the South, reacted to the aftermath of the 72 offensive, as well as the accords. Because in, in my reckoning, and Jay could probably correct me on this or add more to it, there is, after 73, a ever-shrinking resolve or willpower within the South, or perhaps a diminished hope that things will work out, that the Republic will survive. And a lot of that's you know, contingent on what people on the ground and how people on the ground view the accords, view the possibilities of the Republic surviving or the possibility of a North Vietnamese communist victory and how they themselves on a family individual level begin reconciling and accommodating themselves to that. I think if we knew the answer to that, we'd probably better understand what happens in 75 and the speed with which the Republic collapses. But again, Jay's the expert on that. So I want to defer to him if he has a good answer. Right, well, there is a, there is a great deal of, thanks to, there's a great deal of discussion about that. Um, and it's funny, some of the sort of the really hardline um, NLF people like Matt and Ben looked at the Paris Peace Accords as actually Hanoi selling out their interests, which is a very different um, uh, sort of viewpoint uh, of things. But um, there is a great deal of discussion in North Vietnamese texts and primary sources um, how the troops in the South, um, many of whom looked at the Paris Peace Accords as we can go home, uh, the war is over. Um, and so there's a great deal of effort to sort of stiffen everyone's resolve. They sent Politburo members down. They sent all kinds of people to sort of like, uh, the war is not over. You know, look at the South Vietnamese. They're breaking the ceasefire, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a tremendous amount of effort, uh, propaganda effort, uh, sustained to, to sustain morale in the South. But um, on the South Vietnamese side, there was a great, the same thing happened. A lot of troops said, you know what, war's over and desertion rates skyrocketed. Um, and so the South Vietnamese took a lot of their army cadets and sent them all these teams out to the villages and the, and the units trying to buck up morale again. Uh, we know we can't trust the communists. Look, they're attacking us. So um, your point is well taken, but there was a great deal of effort on both sides to sort of like, you know, maintain morale. I want to- your, 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 I see your NF, NLF angle with Madam Vin is interesting because one of the things I always, I've always thought about is how many prominent positions in the, in the new United you know, Unified Government did the NF, NLF really receive? And I'm thinking, not, not many, you know, that, that I know of. So uh, it's it, you're right. I think it's a whole other uh, way of looking at it and give you either a chance to respond or I think I cut Tom off there. Well, I was just going to say, I want to echo Jay's point that I'd love to see more material out of North Vietnam. I'm particularly interested in the degree to which there was a peace faction in the North. 
Um, the, the Han Nguyen, of course, had done this for the 67 period, where she argues that there had to be a purge before the Tet Offensive. And it'd be interesting to know if there wasn't substantial political opposition or at least second thoughts within the Politburo about uh, maybe focusing on uh, getting that reconstruction aid from the Americans and, and working on our own society and the rest. Um, I, I, tend, I tend to think if there was, it was probably not a significant group, but it still would be interesting to know and uh, to know whether there was a that, that desire, uh, uh, which I think uh, Jay mentioned here in terms of just relief that the war is over, we can go back to normal. Well, going back to Madam Bin for a second, Luke, two of my, two of my favorite cables um, from the South Vietnamese are shortly after the Paris Peace Accords have been signed. And the South Vietnamese ambassador to France, a man named uh, Phang Dam Lam, uh, had just met with um, the PRG folks. There was there was a, a, an established mechanism for them to start talking. And he refers to uh, Madam Bin as they're talking about this, that, that her face was black with rage about what had happened, like she was now having to talk to the South Vietnamese. And then the other, the second one was uh, Boy Zam was still in, uh, still in Paris. And he and Phan Dam Lam had met with Madame Bin and some of the people from the PRG. And so Boy Zam turns to, to Ambassador Lam, who was a known sort of womanizer. He had a very famous uh, South Vietnamese actress as a mistress. He basically tries to convince him to go seduce Madame Ben and sort of take one for the team to sort of break break the ice with the PRG side. So there is a great deal of effort um, in terms of, uh, you know, a great deal of discussion about how enraged some of the PRG people are about what they consider a Hanoi sellout. One other comment I'll make, it just while you were talking, um, a couple months ago, um, I made a first trip to Europe, to Paris, uh, since before the pandemic. And so I'd always wanted to seek out the location of the night of the Paris Peace Talks in 1968, the conference, the International Conference Center. And so I, you know, I, now, you know, now it's a five-star hotel. And so I walked, walked by there and I thought, you know, this is crazy. I can't believe that, that the peace talks were held in such a prominent public place. Now, we know the real action was in the private talks. But I thought, you know, it made me wonder, one of the lessons of the peace talks and the peace accords is that Americans would never agree to do this again. Um, and I can't imagine ever doing this in a major public venue with lots of traffic in a very busy city. Uh, it's just one of these moments I had when I walked by. Uh, impossible. I assume the French were wiretapping everything and nothing was secret. Um, and if they weren't, they missed an opportunity, as I think John Negroponte or somebody told me at one point. But as I walked by this huge, huge conference center, and you can kind of still see where the original signs were, where the talks, where you enter the conference center, you go in one way, you go out the other. It was fascinating for me to see it. Um, but that, one of the lessons learned is we would never, ever do this sort of thing again. I can't imagine with Ukraine, you know, we're all going to meet at a five-star hotel in the in the grand ballroom, and we're just going to work it out. <laughs> um, Anyway, this is an observation that maybe you'll want to comment on. Um, but as as we will transition here to the the final part of our panel, as I'm I'm looking at the questions that have come in, and some of these have more than one part. So I will just read one at a time and let uh, whoever respond that wants to respond to to this or anything else that might have occurred to you during the course of the conversation. So our very first question is what can policy advisors and leadership learn, I'm assuming today, more recently, from the successes and failures of the 1973 Paris Peace Accords? Well, I think one, one thing is, of course, to recognize that um, uh, a peace accord without substantial enforcement, uh, real teeth in it and uh, mechanisms to make sure that the parties adhere to what they promised that if you do that 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 that's theater that's that's not going to be a a, a serious uh, peace uh, undertaking uh, between two sides and in that sense i think what i think uh, one of the things that came up at the end of today's morning discussion was whether sort of peace in Ukraine uh, was possible. And, and the thinking, you, you know, in order to do something there, you're going to have to ensure that you have real monitoring mechanisms and that there's some guarantees that are significant there. Because um, otherwise, this is, is simply an opportunity to go home. In the way Afghanistan, the peace, it, it, almost identical, that, you know, basically we got out and it was just 
that was it was only theater uh just to conceal the the the, the withdrawal of the united states i would agree with that and i think um to to tom's point is that <clears throat> You can write into an agreement all the enforcement mechanisms and codicils that you want, but um, ultimately, if the other side does not refuses to talk to one side, calls them American puppets, um, insists on total American withdrawal, to me, that's just a smokescreen for the same playbook that the uh, Vietnamese did. The Taliban, I, 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 said, I sat there and watched it and thought they're copying the Vietnamese playbook perfectly. It was just a... a, a effort to get the Americans out and their firepower out and their intelligence out, they could then deal with what they considered corrupt puppets that they could overthrow fairly quickly. And so if you don't see that genuine effort to negotiate peace, if there's not an effort to sit down with the other side and hammer out a power sharing agreement, then it's just it's just a smokescreen. It's, it's just, uh, and, and nothing will ever come of it. You'll be back into it again within two years. Yeah, on that note, one of the things that strikes me uh, working on this book on 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 uh, the 1968, uh, which includes a substantial part on the 68 uh, peace talks, is that you know, consistently the United States is the only party in the talks that actually wants the war to end. Uh, I mean, the others don't seem to have any great uh, disincentive to keep fighting. Uh, and as you say, you know, it, it just becomes a war by other means, and the Americans get out, and whether it's Afghanistan or certainly or, or Ukraine, so that. Certainly that that idea uh, occurred to me, but I think I might have cut you off, David. So I was just going to add that it's a way you're right, like pointing us back to 68. The problems that Tom and Jay both mentioned are apparent throughout the American negotiations, Johnson years all the way till the accords, that there's a sense of sustained disbelief in understanding and knowing what Hanoi's intentions are. And there's always this hope on Johnson's part that the understandings that they negotiate in 68, that Hanoi will not take advantage of the peace talks, that they will sit down with the South Vietnamese and negotiate in earnest, that they should realize those understandings are in reality meaningless, especially with no enforcements. But in many ways, Kissinger either knowingly or unknowingly makes the same mistake in 72 in agreeing to say, okay, you're going to say you're not going to resupply your troops, you're going to agree to a ceasefire in Laos and Cambodia, when all of the evidence on Hanoi's actions indicate very clearly, or should have indicated very clearly, that their goal is completely unchanged, and that while they've switched to the strategy of peace, as Pierre calls it, in 72, late 72 after the offensive, they're also constantly preparing for that resumed strategy of pursuing military victory and reunification with the South under a communist revolution. And so know your enemy should probably be one of the big lessons and points from this, and not just to look at the accords as a product of 72, 73, but begin that story all the way back earlier in the war. That's how America approached negotiations throughout. And to David's point, I mean, you know, we're, and to your point, Luke, you know, we're the ones that are leading the negotiations, which I think is uh, is a ultimately a huge mistake. You know, the negotiation should not be between us acting as a middleman between Hanoi and Saigon or the Taliban and, and, uh, and Kabul. They should be, you know, if they really want to have peace, they should be talking to each other and we'll just sort of take a step back. And the Russians sort of did that. They did not try to interfere um, with, um, with hand with their guns, they would say they would counsel them. They would say this and that. The Chinese did the same thing, but there wasn't any tremendous pressure by the Soviets to like you're going to have to do this or we're cutting off aid, kind of thing. Good point. In the in the in the interest of time, I will move on to question number two, kind of shifting back to the American domestic situation when we didn't we didn't entirely address this element. Uh, how did the inflation and economic woes of the 1970s play into the decision by Congress to cut off aid to South Vietnam? Well, I, I think it's critical in many ways. Even Richard Nixon in 1969, before we think of the real sharp inflation of the 70s, he has a conversation with key congressional leaders before he goes to meet the astronauts after they come back from the moon landing. And it's before he gives the Guam Doctrine and the Nixon Doctrine speech. 
And he and congressional leaders are very concerned, summer 69, that America's economy will dictate a reduced footprint abroad. And Nixon's responding to that with the Nixon doctrine and Vietnamization. But nevertheless, his efforts to deal with balance of payments, uh, worsening economy in the 70s, in many ways also inflicts real pain on the South Vietnamese economy, especially as goods later on in the war, post-accords especially, uh, the oil shocks of the 70s, complicates the amount of money they're having to spend on basic munitions and fuel and the like. And it's also a testament, a lot of the South Vietnamese officials, at least from my research in Saigon, shows that they're acutely concerned in 69 and 70 about the American economy and also their ability to get the money they need from Congress to finance not necessarily military Vietnamization, but economic Vietnamization as well, so that they can sustain themselves economically, they can start paying for their own budget and the like. But America's economic woes in the 70s complicate that for Saigon in a way that they're part of this larger macroeconomic environment. Yeah, uh, Luke, as I pointed out, uh, I spent a great deal of time uh, discussing this in uh, Drawn Swords. Uh, I think if there's one untapped area of the war, it is this is the economic side, because it drove so much, as David mentioned, um, there was a real concern in Saigon um, that the economy was uh, far more paramount in driving decisions than we've ever recognized. Uh, the South Vietnamese budget simply could not even begin to support an ex expanded military because as we're withdrawing troops, she has got to build, bolster his own military and who's gonna pay for that? And so the Americans are gonna have to pay for that because the South Vietnamese can't. So this whole idea of, um, of the economic side of things is one of the really unrepresented areas of study of the Vietnam War. And I tried to address a great deal of that from the South Vietnamese side uh, in my book, Drawn Swords. Um, I think you were gonna jump in there a little bit ago. I'm just gonna say that I think the, the ultimate cutoff of aid or the restrictions on aid had didn't really have an economic justification. Those were those were simply because it was thought that this war was futile. I mean, cutting off air power in 73, for example, or air operations. So I don't think I don't think the economy was crucial there, but I agree with Jay and with David that it, it had in the background, especially in South Vietnam, the, the consequences of the reduction in American assistance in terms of the type of economy we had fostered there were much more consequential than I think people realized. Yeah, of course, the, the questioner uh, didn't, didn't mention Watergate, but I, I assume um, Watergate also perhaps even more than domestic economic considerations by the spring of 73 uh, was obviously a major factor, too. Um, question three, how did Vietnam's fall to communism affect its economic trajectory in the last 50 years in comparison to its neighbors? That's a fascinating question. Um, in the initial years after the collapse, uh, Vietnam's economy, the attempt at imposing a, 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 a collective system on agriculture in the South, uh, the, the communization, uh, the, the following of old fashioned sort of Soviet type policies uh, was a disaster. Uh, Vietnam went from a, a, an exporter of rice to an importer of rice. The economy collapsed. You had uh, one of the reasons for the boat people's departure. Uh, the uh, exodus from Vietnam was partially economic. Uh, it, I recently was in Vietnam. And if you talk to Vietnamese of a certain age, what they remember about the 10 years after the end of the war is just the incredible hardships of that period. Um, after 96, the death of Li Zhuang, who was the sort of Stalinist leader of, North, of Vietnam, and the beginnings of an opening, you begin to see the development of prosperity. Vietnamese have seen in their lifetime of a certain age, they've seen an extraordinary change in the relative prosperity of their country. 
um, before and after, the, you might say, the opening to the West and to um, following, in a way, following the Chinese model of maintaining political, tight political control of the Communist Party, but opening the country up to foreign investment, to uh, uh, opening it up to allowing for people to get rich, uh, to, to make money, this sort of thing. And, and so Vietnam today is exceedingly more prosperous than it was, of course, earlier. Um, comparatively, probably not as prosperous as some of the countries in the region, but uh, certainly not as far behind as it once was. Yeah, you anticipated, uh, uh, I was going to comment that there's another way to ask that question, which is if they weren't part of the so-called Asian tigers initially, what do they start doing right, you know, to get where they're at today? Um, but uh, David or Jay, any final words on that, or we will move on? Um, okay, question four, and we've got about 15 minutes left, so I think we're doing okay. Uh, how does modern day, it's, it's all modern, how does modern day Vietnam understand President Nixon and the Vietnam War? Second part, has the rise of China's influence in the region and additional competition between China and Vietnam reflected on their opinion of the United States and the conflict? That's a tough one. Um... Vietnam prides itself on its um, neutrality in conflicts. So it's even though um, one of the things that uh, several Vietnamese said to me during my recent trip was they supported Ukraine. Uh, officially, they don't. Officially, they don't talk about that. But uh, the public sympathy is, of course, for a country being invaded by another. And they, they see some parallels there to their own history, of course. Um, I don't know that one of the things that's hard in a country like Vietnam um, that's still ruled by the party that won and has its legitimacy because of its victory over the United States is allowing for much retrospective or revisionist thinking. Um, you certainly hear more of that in South, in the Southern part of Vietnam. You hear more sort of challenges to the orthodoxy about the, the, the heroic struggle and the victory of the Vietnamese Communist Party. But uh, Vietnamese, the actual sort of transition and thinking, um, hard to say. I mean, Vietnam is such a different country now, and so many of the people now, it's such a young country, uh, have no real experience of the war um, uh, themselves and uh, sort of think of the United States as a place they want to go often and uh, want to travel to and that they have family in often from the diaspora. That, that took place after the end of the war. It's just very different, but I, it, it hard, it's hard to answer the, the questioner's uh, um, the questioner's question in a, in, a, in a solid way, because I think it, that type of discussion is not really something that happens in Vietnam today. For me, I would add too, it's, it's not clear in my own thinking the extent to which most Vietnamese, or at least the subset who think about this issue at all, how they view the American occupation, to use that term for a moment, uh, differently than the French or the Japanese or the long, you know, 2000 year history of relations with the Chinese. I think a good, good historian can take this discussion back at least 2000 years after all. Um, and so I think that part's unclear. I see in some state news reports, acknowledgement of, you know, there's still an awful lot of infrastructure in this nation that, that was created by the Americans and it's not really commenting one way or the other, but I think at least an acknowledgement that it comes from, from that era. Um, but um, anything, it's a complicated question for sure, but anything, Jay or David, you might want to add? Um, I can just say that speaking with a lot of the U.S. government officials who travel back and forth to Vietnam over the last 15 years uh, as part of the POWMIA group have mentioned to me that the government itself still uses the war as a, you know, as a prop to, to maintain their one party rule as you know look what we did we, we we won the war we unified the country and therefore we have a a reason to be involved yet if you talk to sort of the average people um and as tom mentioned it's a very young country most people um who were born after the war have a pretty positive view of the united states as a place that they want to go to as a place that they as a people they want to emulate and a lot of that's just pure commercial goods and, and pop music and all the sort of things that young people are interested in um, and may making money. Um, communism itself is a sort of a dying breed held onto by sort of the old guard. But um, I think for the most part, when I was 
I've been told is that most people view the Americans as uh, our America in a positive, positive way. Yeah, I, I, Tom, you were there more recently than me, but I, I think um, I found it to be an exceedingly uh, pro-American place to visit, uh, sort of everywhere I went, in some ways more so than Western Europe, at least parts of Western Europe. Uh, but uh, I, I was really struck by that. And, and whether or not you want to comment on that, I, I will use that as a segue to our second to last question before we get to sort of closing remarks which was, did the negotiations, uh, which led up to the peace accords, um, in terms of the bilateral relationship between South Vietnam and the United States, did, did the announcement of, quote, pieces at hand, uh, fumble relations between the United States and South Vietnam? It, uh, it, it certainly did. I mean, President Tu was, was outraged um, by the agreement, which he saw as a sellout, and especially the provisions on North Vietnamese troops. David David knows this as well from the the discussion. So, uh, but it 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 was it it created a real crisis in relations between uh, the South Vietnamese and the United States. And um, uh, you know, Kissinger uh, has this plaintive moment where he's arguing with two, and he says, "We have mortgaged our foreign policy for four years to the defense of this country, and here you are." Are now you're not willing to agree, and uh, there was this. Uh, it was a tremendous um, a crisis between the United States and two, and um, uh, you know, down to the last minute, the idea of whether two would actually agree to the accords. Um, he had to. Uh, Nixon called in some conservative senators to talk to two and tell him that you know, without this agreement, the Americans might not be able to give you aid. All of these sorts of things. So it was a it was a very a tense moment in U.S. South Vietnamese relations. I'm just going to add too. I, I remember um, the first time I listened to the the Nixon tape, where Henry Kissinger leaves the press briefing room and comes into the Oval Office, and of course Nixon and Kissinger are sort of celebrating this domestic policy victory, you know, in terms of seeing it in terms of, uh, there's no discussion of foreign policy at all. It's domestic policy. The media is finally giving us positive coverage. And Henry Kissinger says something to Nixon like, Mr. President, they were hanging from the rafters. And, you know, and you see that that image of all the press kind of packed in there, right? And, you know, it's, it's not, I think, not far from the truth. And I think that the lesson is that by that point in the conflict, um, my reading of the tapes is that Nixon and Kissinger are seeing this almost completely in terms of domestic politics. You know, and the need to Nixon saying things like, you know, I, I can't, I, I, it has to be done in this term. It can't go into a second term of office, uh, otherwise it's it's a it's a failure. But I think that that ultimately um, sets us up. And if you uh, want to jump in, you'll have a chance in this final question, because I think that provides a segue to our final question which has been debated a lot by historians, but I think still very much debated today. Could Richard Nixon have gotten the same deal in 1969 as he did in 1973? And knowing what the hour of the day is here, um, and you know, this could be a whole dissertation, uh, how, what, what say you? Uh, the, um, the response is absolutely not. Hanoi uh, had absolutely uh, not budge from his prior uh, negotiation stance, would not budge for years. Um, it wasn't until the failure of the 72 offensive and prodding from uh, its allies that it finally grudgingly gave in on the second part the second part of its two core principles. It was not going to remove North Vietnamese troops, but it would be flexible on the on a government in South Vietnam. and it didn't it didn't get there until 72. So in terms of us being able to get a same deal we've gotten in 69, I, I think it's just beyond pure speculation, which we also hopefully will have a few seconds to talk about the so-called decent interval, interval theory, which I also think is preposterous, but I'll, I will stop and let David uh, continue. Well, no, I think you're exactly right, Jay. It's, I think in the category of John Lewis Gaddis, we now know since we have access or more access to the Vietnamese communist views and what they're writing and saying, as well as the benefit of hindsight, I, I agree with you. I can't see any scenario that they would have accepted the basis of the 73 Accords in 68 or 69. 
but rather would have continued prosecuting the war as they did. I agree again as well. I, I think this is a this is largely a political myth um, in the United States that basically is it's an attack on Nixon. It's basically saying he cost 20,000 lives and he could have had this agreement at first. And, and that's it's it's historical revisionism at its worst. Um, but it, it, it of course, it, it is what. Um, uh, you know, the politics of Vietnam were really the, the domestic side was always a very crucial side. And so it's not surprisingly that we still see it in that way or that people are still uh, making that case. Well, in terms of final remarks, uh, we'll do have a chance for a final round robin here. Look, this is the 50th anniversary. Uh, put it on your calendar now for the centennial. I hope we all come back here for <laughs> another uh, another panel to talk about the centennial of the Paris Peace Accords. So uh, whether final uh, thoughts, words of wisdom, or what in the world are we gonna be talking about on the centennial, uh, go for it. Well, I think um, sometimes, and Pierre brought this up on the earlier panel, is that we have a tendency to focus too much on what the Americans could or could not have done. Um, and less on uh, what I view as North Vietnamese um, betrayal of the written word, and in some in some ways the South Vietnamese kind of going back on themselves also. So I think that there was never any effort on either Vietnamese side to really try to find a peace. Both sides viewed each other with complete suspicion. So I think we have a tendency to sort of like, as to your point in the very beginning of this panel put too much on the American side and not enough on the Vietnam, not blame or thing on the Vietnamese side, because ultimately once the Americans withdrew, it was the two Vietnamese sides, uh, which was ultimately gonna come down to anyways, that um, could not find a way to make peace. I, um, if I make it to the centenary of this, I'd be older than Henry Kissinger. I'd be delighted to get there. But uh, one thing I would love to, to see is a political evolution in Vietnam that ultimately allows a more democratic and pluralistic Vietnam to actually debate the civil war that they had and to discuss whether it was worth it, whether the the, the loss of life inflicted by the determination of the leadership in North Vietnam to win was worth it. It'd be lovely to see Vietnam become more democratic and uh, and and uh, Americans and Vietnamese be able to discuss this and, and in a way, uh, as much as I, I, I've also recently been in Japan, another country that the United States had an effect on, it'd be nice to, you know, we, America has this relationship sometimes with former adversaries. It would be nice to see a democratic evolution in Vietnam that would allow something like that. And that would be great to to, to sort of see in a hundred years. But I, 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 Luke, uh, unless, unless they come up with a pill uh, uh, providing longevity like a Henry Kissinger, I'm not sure I'm going to be around for that one. Well, maybe David will. Maybe, but not likely. Uh, to, to parry off of Tom's comments, though, I, I do think in the long sweep of history, looking at other bad human rights actors of the 70s, South Korea and Taiwan, that their evolution to prosperous countries, democratic countries, I think in many ways complicates our memory of the accords and what could have happened. Uh, I would share Tom's thoughts that I'd hope in time that perhaps the more democratic elements of Saigon, the best elements of the Republic of Vietnam might one day affect and help evolve Vietnam in a more pluralist and democratic fashion. Well, let me just say this has been an absolutely delightful experience for me that I think the only way it would be more delightful if it had been in person. Uh, so let's find a way to do that before uh, too much longer. Otherwise, uh, as, as, as they say, and uh, Mr. President, I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Nichter, and thank you, panel. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's commemoration marking the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Paris Peace Accords. I invite you to connect with the Nixon Foundation online at Nixon Foundation across social media and sign up to receive our emails by going to nixonfoundation.org. Thank you.